reading from 1 Corinthians. I do not want you to be unaware, brothers and sisters, that our ancestors were all under the clouds and all passed through the sea and all were baptized into Moses in the clouds and in the sea and all ate the same spiritual food and all drank the same spiritual drink. For they drank from the spiritual rock that followed them, and the rock was Christ. Nevertheless, God was not pleased with both of them, and they were struck down in the wilderness. Now these things occurred as examples for us, so that we might not desire evil as they do. Do not become adulterers, as some of them did, as it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink, and they rose up to play. We must not indulge in sexual immorality, as some of them did, and 23,000 fell in a single day. We must not put Christ to the test, as some of them did, and were destroyed by serpents. And do not complain, as some of them did, and were destroyed by destroying them. These things happened to them to serve as an example, and they were written down to instruct us on whom the ends of the ages have come. So if you think you are standing, watch out that you do not fall. No testing has overtaken you that is not common to everyone. God is faithful, and he will not let you be tested beyond your strength. But with the testing, he will also provide you the way out, so that you may be able to endure. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. God 
is our home. Now, it seems like we should be able to remember that kind of thing, but a lot of times we tend to forget. A lot of times we forget that God is our home. We forget to, to focus on God. And we instead end up focusing on ourselves. We focus on our problems instead. <laughs> But Paul here in this scripture is trying to drive home a point. That we are never going to find the hope that we are looking for if we only focus on ourselves and our own problems. Kind of like if you go down to the DIA and you're looking at this beautiful painting. And the paint, painting is incredible. Right? And you're just sucked into it. So just your curiosity peaks. And you want to know all about the artist. So what you do is you sit there and you stare. And you stare and you stare at this painting all day long. And as much as you stare at this painting, it's really not going to tell you much about the artist <coughs> and him or herself. Their life, their struggles that they went through. So if you want to know more about an artist, you need to focus on the artist and not necessarily the product. And it's the same with us. If we keep focusing on ourselves and our own troubles, we are never going to see the hope that's out there. You see, what we do need to do is to take our attention away from ourselves and focus our attention on God. But for the most part, of course, the world doesn't, doesn't work like that. We live in a world, for the most part, we do focus on ourselves. For example, you see a lot of people in the world today focused on gadgets. You know, uh, and, and they focus on dieting and exercising and taking vitamins, vitamin supplements and all that kind of stuff. You know, just stuff in general. And there's nothing wrong with dieting and exercising and taking vitamins. I do that myself. But if you put all your attention and all your energy to trying to make your body last forever, I hate to tell you this, but at some point you are going to be disappointed. <laughs> at some point or another, our bodies wear out. And ultimately, no matter how many push-ups that we do, or how many low-fat meals that we eat, someday we're going to die. So our hope isn't here in our physical bodies. But the Apostle Paul and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ reminds us that we do have hope. We are a people of hope. We have a hope in, in a God that loves us with an eternal love. And never, ever gives up on us. There's an old story about how Winston Churchill was asked to give a commencement address at some college. And after a lengthy, bloviating introduction, Churchill is reported to have risen up from his seat, strode to the podium, stared fixedly at the audience, and he pronounced solemnly, solemnly, never give up. And then he turned around, walked back to his chair, and he sat down. <laughs> well, the stunned students, they sat there in silence. They, you know, they just didn't know what to make of it. Then, then Churchill, with perfect timing, once again rose from his chair, <coughs> returned to the podium, and again announced, never give up. Now, terrified that they might respond improperly, the audience didn't utter a squeak as their speaker again returned to his seat. And sure enough, Churchill returned to the podium again and again and yet again, five times, and each time delivering his single-minded message. Never give up. And then at last, feeling that he had made his point, Churchill returned to the podium no more. Now, I'll bet you a dime to donuts that every graduate in that audience never forgot that he or she was to never give up. Has the church forgotten that it has received the very same message from God? The God that assures, us that, that assures us that we should always 
have hope because in all of the scriptures, in the Hebrew Testament and the New Testament alike, we have a record of how, how God has never, 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 never given up. Adam and Eve disobeyed the very first rule, but God never gave up. Abraham wondered and Sarah laughed, but God never gave up. Moses hid and shook with fear. What happened? God, God never gave up. There you go. Saul was the same, but God never gave up. David fought it against Uriah, and God never gave up. Ahab sold down to Syria, but God never gave up. Israel, they fell to pieces, but a little more enthusiasm here. <laughs> there we go. The Jewish people, they all became exiles, but